And while I am excited to study all of the books of the Bible that we haven't covered yet, the one that kept coming up was the book of Isaiah. And let me agree to that. Okay. Got it. All right. Uh, the one that kept coming up was the book of Isaiah, all 66 wonderful chapters. So for the next 66 weeks, Lord willing, uh, we're going to be going verse by verse, line by line through the wonderful book of Isaiah. So if you guys would please open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1. And while you are turning there, I wanted to share with you, I'm not going to read this verbatim, but this is just an excerpt from uh, Eugene Peterson. Now, he is uh, the gentleman that uh, helped put together the Message Bible. And I have referenced this several times. This is the Message Bible here. So you can see the lights there. Uh, this is a great Bible. And I will usually, when I sit down to study, I will usually read the passage in the Message first just because it helps to bring some clarity and color to the text, uh, because as you read some of the old English, uh, it can sometimes get lost in translation. So I wanted to share with you just some of his thoughts uh, as he was introducing the book of Isaiah. Uh, here's what he had to say. He said, prophets train us in discerning the difference between the ways of the world and the ways of the gospel, keeping us present to the presence of God. The prophets are not reasonable, <laughs> accommodating themselves to what makes sense to us. The prophets are not diplomatic. They're not tactful, and they will not tactfully negotiate an agreement that will allow us to have a say in the outcome as it relates to God governing our lives. What the prophets do is they, uh, what they do is haul us unceremoniously into a reality far too large to be accounted for by our meager expectations. Basically, the prophets do two things. They work to get people to accept the worst as God's judgment, not a religious catastrophe or political disaster, but judgment. If what seems like the worst turns out to be God's judgment, it can be embraced, not denied or avoided, for God is good and intends our salvation. So judgment, while certainly not what we human beings anticipate in our planned future, can never be the worst that can happen. It is the best. Now, I want to read that again, so pay close attention to the statement. Judgment, while certainly not what we human beings anticipate in our planned future, can never be the worst thing that can happen. It is the best, for it is the work of God to set the world and us right. The prophets then work to get people who were beaten down to open themselves up to a hope in God's future. Now, one of the bad habits that we pick up early in our lives is separating things and people into the secular and the sacred categories. Now, we assume that the secular is what we are more or less in charge of, our jobs, our time, our entertainment, our governments, our social relations, where the sacred is what God has charge of. Worship and the Bible, heaven and hell, church and prayer. And we then contrive to set aside a sacred place for God, designed, we say, to honor God, but really intended to keep God in his place leaving us free to have the final say about everything else that goes on. Prophets will have none of this. They contend that everything, absolutely everything, takes place on sacred ground. And God has something to say about every aspect of our lives, the way we feel and act 
in the so-called privacy of our hearts and our homes and the way we make our money and the way we spend it. The politics we embrace, the wars that we fight, the catastrophes we endure, the people we hurt and the people we help, nothing is hidden from the scrutiny of God. Nothing is exempt from the rule of God. Nothing escapes the purposes of God. Holy, holy, holy. And as I was writing this, it quickly became evident. Now, this is me talking. As I was writing this, it quickly became evident why I believe God has us here in the book of Isaiah. Because I believe that we're going to find a lot of similarities to what was going on during Isaiah's time, which is 2,700 years ago when he's writing this, to what is going on right now in our world and in America in 2022. Prophets make it impossible to evade God or make detours around God. Prophets insist on receiving God in every nook and cranny of life. For a prophet, God is more real than the next door neighbor. For Isaiah, words are watercolors and melodies and chisels to make truth and beauty and goodness. Or as the case may be, hammers and swords and scalpels to unmake sin and guilt and rebellion. Isaiah does not merely convey information. He creates visions, delivers revelation, and arouses belief. He is a poet in the most fundamental sense, a maker, making God present, and that presence urgent. Isaiah is the supreme poet prophet to come out of the Hebrew people. I Isaiah is a large presence in the lives of people who live by faith in God, who submit themselves to being shaped by the word of God and are on the lookout for the holy. Now, for my note takers, you know, being here in the first chapter of Isaiah, some of your notes I want you to just write the holy. Because we're going to see this as a common theme throughout the book of Isaiah, the holy. Now, the characteristic name for God in this book is the Holy. And as we read this large and comprehensive gathering of messages that were preached to the ancient people of Israel, we find ourselves immersed in both the presence and the action of the Holy. The book of Isaiah is expansive, dealing with virtually everything that is involved in being a people of God living on this planet we call Earth. The impressive art of Isaiah involves taking the stuff of our ordinary and often disappointing human experience and showing us how it is the very stuff that God uses to create and save and give hope. I was thinking about that as we were going through the prayer requests this morning because, boy, um, there was a lot of them this morning, probably more than I've heard in a very, very long time, you know, and we look at this and we go, why is this happening? You know, this is a disappointing human experience, but through this study, God is going to show us that this is the very stuff that God uses to create and to save people. It could be through illness and the difficulties of life that people cry out to God and finally come to know him as Lord and Savior. As this vast paranor paranorma or panorama opens up before us, it turns out that nothing is unusable by God. He uses everything and everybody as material for his work, which is the remaking of the mess we have made of our lives. The name Isaiah, again, this is another note you'll want to put in your Bible. The name Isaiah means God saves. So right in the front chapter right there where Isaiah chapter one, so Isaiah means God saves. The prominent themes repeated and developed through this vast work are judgment. In fact, verses or chapters one through 39 are going to deal specifically with 
judgment. Chapters 40 through 55 will deal specifically with comfort, and chapters 56 through 66 will deal with the message of hope. All three of these elements, judgment, comfort, and hope, are present on every page, but each also gives distinction to the three movements of the book that so powerfully enacts salvation. I, I always enjoy the Old Testament. I know people, you know, love the New Testament because it's in the New Testament where we get to learn about Jesus and his time and his ministry on earth and the, the miracles. Well, guess what? We're going to read about all of those things in the book of Isaiah as this prophet speaks and foretells the coming of the Messiah. Jesus Christ. So with that as an introduction, I want to read together Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, there are 31 verses here, and I'm going to read it to you again out of the message. Now, again, for clarity and understanding, as I'm reading through this, I just want you guys to understand, as you read along in your Bible, it's going to sound somewhat different, but I, I merely want you to listen and understand the context of this. And then once we go verse by verse, line by line, I'll go back to my NIV translation. But here is Isaiah chapters one, or chapter one, verses one through 31 from the message, okay? Verse one, <clears throat> the vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw regarding Judah and Jerusalem during the times of the king of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Verse 2. Heaven and earth, you are the jury. Listen to God's case. I had children, and I raised them well, and they turned on me. The ox knows who's boss. The mule knows the hand that feeds him, but not Israel. My people don't know up from down. Shame, misguided, God dropouts, staggering under their guilt baggage. Gang of miscreants, band of vandals. My people have walked out on me. Their God turned their backs on the holy of Israel, walked off, and never looked back. Verse 5. Why bother? <clears throat> Why bother even trying to do anything with you when you just keep to your bullheaded ways? You keep beating your heads against brick walls. Everything within you protects against or protests against you from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. Nothing is working right. Wounds and bruises and running sores, untended, unwashed, unbandaged. Your country is laid waste. Your cities burned down. Your land is destroyed by outsiders while you watch, reduced to rubble by barbarians. Daughter, Zion is deserted, like a tumbled down shack on a dead end street, like a tar paper shanty on the wrong side of the tracks, like a sinking ship abandoned by the rats. If God of the angel armies hadn't left us a few survivors, we'd be as desolate as Sodom, doomed like Gomorrah. Verse 10. Listen to my message, you Sodom schooled leaders. Receive God's revelation, you Gomorrah schooled people. Verse 11. Why this frenzy of sacrifices? God's asking. Don't you think I've had my fill of burnt sacrifices, rams, and plump grain-fed calves? Don't you think I've had my fill of blood from bulls and lambs and goats? When you come before me, whoever gave you the idea of acting like this, running here and there, doing this and that, all this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship? Verse 13. So quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious 
games, monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I will not be listening. And do you know why? Because you've been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. So go home and wash up, clean up your act, sweep your lives clean of your evil doing so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Go to bat for the defenseless. Verse 18. Come, sit down. Let's argue this out. This is God's message. If your sin are blood red, they'll be white, snow white. If they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. If you'll willingly obey, you'll feast like kings. But if you're willful and stubborn, you'll die like dogs. That's right. God says so. Verse 21. Oh, can you believe it? The chaste city has become a whore. She was once all justice, everyone living as good neighbors, and now they're all at one another's throats. Your coins are all counterfeits. Your wine is watered down. Your leaders are turncoats who keep company with crooks, and they sell themselves to the highest bidder and grab anything not nailed down. They never stand up for the homeless, and they never stick up for the defenseless. Verse 24. This decree, therefore, of the master, God of the angel armies, the strong one of Israel, this is it. I'll get my oppressors off my back, and I'll get back at my enemies, and I'll give you the back of my hand. Purge the junk from your life. Clean you up. I'll set honest judges and wise counselors among you, just like it was back in the beginning. Then you'll be renamed city that treats people right, the true blue city. God's right ways will put Zion right again. God's right actions will restore her penance. But it's curtains for rebels and God traitors, a dead end for those who walk out on God. Your dalliances in those oak grove shrines will leave you looking mighty foolish all that fooling around in God and goddess gardens that you thought was the latest thing, you'll end up like an oak tree with all of its leaves falling off, like an unwatered garden withered and brown. The big man will turn out to be dead, bark and twigs, and his work, the spark that starts the fire, that exposes man and work both as nothing but cinders and smoke. Wow. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning as we open up your word, Lord, as uh, you have us here in Isaiah. And Lord, we are excited about what you're going to share with us uh, through these passages, Lord. And Lord, admittedly, a little uh, timid about what you're going to be sharing with us as Lord, you just use this book to expose just many of the things that we too are guilty of as a nation, as a people, as supposed God followers, Lord. As I read through just chapter one, I see so many similarities, Lord, between what, what you were having Isaiah write to your people then, and Lord, now you're here writing it to us and sharing it with us all again. And Lord, I just pray that you would. Speak to each one of us through your passage this morning. Uh, Lord, that you bring clarity to what it is that you've written here, why it's here, what you want us to see, what you want us to understand. And Lord, that we would leave here this morning with application, with direction, with 
knowledge and Lord, with your love in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to get out of the way this morning. Lord, nobody wants to hear from me. Lord, we are here to hear from you. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to soften our hearts to your message this morning. And Lord, that you would also keep all of the distractions that seem to always pop up during this time. Lord, just keep them at bay so that we can be here focused on you. So Lord, we commit our time to you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as is the case with most prophets, we actually don't know much about Isaiah's life because he didn't talk about himself a lot. He was very focused on the message. Now, we do know that Isaiah lived in Jerusalem. We know that he was married, and we know that he had at least two sons. We also know from chapter 20 that his ministry was not an easy one, for he was told to walk around Judah for three years without shoes or clothes. <laughs> now, stay tuned for chapter 20. We'll get there, Lord willing, in 20 weeks from now. Uh, but imagine if God started out your ministry by saying, okay, I need you to walk around without shoes or clothes for the next three years. That's what Isaiah did. Now, Jewish tradition tells us that Isaiah's father was King Uzziah's brother. So Isaiah is the nephew to a king. So understand that. We also know that Isaiah frequented the court and was close to a number of kings, namely King Hezekiah, who we will discover was good friends with Isaiah. So it is very possible that Isaiah was of royal seed. Now, Jewish tradition tells us that he was sawn in half by wicked King Manasseh. So, you know, let's fast forward to the end of Isaiah's life. And we read about this if you want to uh, study ahead. In Hebrews chapter 11, it is where it is talked about those who were sawn asunder for their faith. A reference many believe is directed towards Isaiah. So it is believed Isaiah, the author of this book, was sawn in half for his belief in God. Now, the book of Isaiah has been called the Bible in miniature. Now, I want you guys to listen to this because this fascinated me because I'd never heard this before. Uh, for some of you, this may be review. Others of you, you may be, find this as interesting as I did. But the book of Isaiah, and I did not know this until this had been decided and we were, we were going to study it, but there are 66 chapters in Isaiah, just as there are 66 books in the Bible. Now, chapters 1 through 39 talk about the shortcomings and the sins of the people of Judah and Israel, and they deal with the law and government. So the first 39 books of Isaiah, that's what we're going to be dealing with, judgment and the law and government. Just as the first 39 books in the Bible, Genesis to Malachi, cover law, government, and the shortcomings of God's people. But in chapter 40 of Isaiah, suddenly a new direction is taken. For there we read, comfort ye my people. And in chapter 40 of Isaiah, love and grace will be introduced. Now, can anybody tell me what is the 40th book of the Bible? The answer, Matthew. So where Isaiah chapter 40 begins to talk about love and grace and comfort for God's people, that is Matthew, New Testament, where we are introduced to Jesus as the Messiah, which I thought was pretty cool. Then in Isaiah chapters 40 through 66, they will speak of Jesus constantly. In the book of Isaiah, we will read of his incarnation. We will read of the virgin birth. 
We will read of Jesus as a youngster in Nazareth. We will read of the text of his first sermon and of his ministry to the Gentiles. We will read of his miracles, of his suffering, of his resurrection, of his ascension and exaltation. And in the last chapter of Isaiah, that's Isaiah 66, we will read of the millennial kingdom. Along with the books of Genesis, Psalms, John, Romans, and Revelation, the book of Isaiah has been considered by a consensus of Bible scholars to be one of the six cornerstone books of the biblical understanding and revelation. Wow. Now, if I wasn't excited about that study before or about the study before, now I'm really excited because this is, I mean, how cool is this? I mean, Isaiah 1 through 66, it's like reading the whole Bible front to, front to back. So it's going to be a fun and interesting journey. Uh, glad you guys are here to join it and share in it with me uh, as uh, God reveals things to us and opens up our eyes as to some things that are going on here in our world that are very similar to what Isaiah was seeing during his time. So Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1. Now I'm going to the NIV version of the Bible, which I know many of you have. Okay. Verse 1, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. <clears throat> Isaiah was a visionary in the truest sense of the word. In Bible days, the prophets were often called seers because they saw things others didn't. And the same is still true today. People accuse us, that is Christians, of having blind faith. But our faith isn't blind. On the contrary, it sees more because we see things to which unbelievers are blind. Why do you think about that? As a believer, the world refers to us as Christians as blind. You know, you guys are just living in blind faith. But we know that for anyone who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they are blind to the truth of the gospel. And if they are blind to the truth of the gospel, then they are blind to so many things that go on in our world, and they are clueless about them. You know, I'm always fascinated, uh, you know, when we hear all these scientists coming on TV and talking about the latest strain and, you know, why and, you know, nobody can figure it out. And it's just calamity. It's confusion. And nobody has any answers. I have answers. Because the Bible is very clear. The Lord is getting our attention. We need to wake up, people, and we need to get God back into our countries and back into our homes and back into our lives personally. And God uses these types of things. And, you know, COVID has been devastating. And, you know, one of the things that I, I now want to be in prayer about are for all of those people who are sequestered in isolation because it's terrible you know and i'm i had my laptop there i could you know google i had the internet i could read i i could interact i could zoom call i could facetime but then i think about you know we all have friends and family that are getting up in years and many nursing homes have had to shut down and and block off entire wings and people have had to be isolated by themselves for weeks at a time. Uh, I had a great uncle that got COVID in the nursing home he was staying at. He was 98 years old. And he was one of the most social people you've ever met. He loved people. He loved going around the nursing home. Uh, just the sweetest guy. Uh, very popular with the ladies at 98 years of age because he was just so sweet and thoughtful. And he loved to just go and, and have Bible studies with people. But they got COVID in the nursing home and they put him in a room and said, you can't leave. And he was there almost three months. 
Now, eventually he did get COVID, supposedly, and he did pass away. But I don't think it was COVID that killed him. I think it was isolation. It, it is hard to be isolated, to be alone. And we have so many people now in our nursing homes and our care facilities that friends and family have kind of forgotten them and they're just there, nobody to talk to. You know, we need to keep them in our prayers because that's tough. But this is getting our attention, right? I think COVID is bringing more people to He's the Solution Ministries because they're looking for answers. And boy, I'll tell you this, if you would like to have the, the shackles of blindness removed from your eyes, acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and Savior and invite him into your heart and make him the Lord of your life and, and watch suddenly how you'll just have this new awareness of things. And you'll look at what's going on in the world very differently. It's not scary when you look at what God is doing and, and how he is orchestrating things to lead to the book of Revelation, the end time prophecies. You know, uh, we're getting ready to start uh, uh, this is spoiler alert. Uh, but we're going to be doing on the for profit side of our business, we're going to be introducing a intro to crypto program because we've got this new thing called cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, of course, leading the charge. And a lot of people think they know a lot about it, but they're looking at it only from a financial standpoint. I want to look at crypto and what it represents potentially for end time prophecy as we look at a one world currency and a one world government. So crypto is a very interesting thing. But we got to look at it from both sides. So be on the lookout for an upcoming email where we talk about this, because it's not just uh, the financial side of the house. We, we have to always consider the spiritual side and what is God doing with this potentially. Again, I don't have all the answers. I got some, you know, interesting points of discussion, but just interesting to see what God is doing. Now, the combined reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah will cover a period of approximately 60 years. So this book of Isaiah is going to be written over these king's reigns by Isaiah. And he will have very close interaction with these kings. So he is uh, at the front lines of what's going on here, uh, beginning in approximately 740 BC. So to give you guys some, some uh, chronological timelines of where we are, 740 BC. So if it's 2022, this is now almost 2800 or 2700 years ago that Isaiah is being written. Now, the importance of the 60 year span that it is gonna take Isaiah to write down these prophecies that God has given him just gives you a, an idea of the breadth and the scope of this book. Now, verse two, hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Now, here in this cosmic courtroom, if you will, the Lord is calling in literally his star, pun intended, witnesses. The stars themselves in all of creation, God is calling on them to consider the indictment against the people that he has nourished, but who have rebelled against him. He says, oh, heavens, listen, O oh, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Now, we are all created beings, beginning with Adam and Eve. God created Adam from the dust of the ground. He created Eve out of a rib, rib from Adam's side. And then through Adam and Eve is where the rest of mankind came from. God's creation. We are all created beings, and we are not accidents. The fact that you are alive at this point in time, in 2022, is no accident. Okay, God did not put you in the wrong century or the wrong decade or the wrong millennium. Okay, he's put you exactly where he needs you 
at this given time. And he has given you experiences. He's given you background. He's given you understanding. He's given you knowledge. He's given you contacts. He's given you relationships. He's given you insight to be used for his work and his purposes on this planet right now. Now, it's important that everybody understands that because we have a tendency to claim to be Christians and then do the things that Christians do, or at least the things we think Christians are supposed to do, like go to church and tithe and be nice to our neighbors and do good things. And so, you know, as we, as we check the boxes of Christian protocol, we think, all right, I'm getting it done. But that's not it, okay? God has given every single one of us the contacts, the relationships, the experiences, the backgrounds, the divorces, the heartache, the losses, the deaths. He's given us all of those things to create a foundation from which he will build within each one of us a specific ministry, a specific purpose, a specific reason or calling. Now, don't misconstrue this. This does not necessarily mean that you're suddenly going to pastor a church or that you're suddenly going to become a, a, a published author or a speaker or a pick something, right? We always think in terms, well, if God's going to use me, it's going to be big. Well, yeah, that's true, but that, that's not big in the world's view. Everything that God has called us to do is important. And for some, that's speaking to hundreds or thousands or millions. And to others, that is speaking to one. The prophet Jeremiah, he spent 40 years ministering to people without a single convert. 40 years. Now, we've been doing He's a Solution Ministry now um, 13 years. And I can't imagine going another 27 years without not a single person accepting Christ. That would be devastating. And I would feel like, well, God, why aren't you using this ministry? But the results are not ours. That, that's up to God. Our responsibility is merely to be faithful, to do what God has called us to do, and to use the gifts and the skills that God has e equipped us with, that has given us. So I mentioned at the top of this, 2022, what are your specific ministry goals? Now, I don't want you to just haphazardly write down, you know, well, I think it would be good to go serve in the homeless ministry this one at one time this year. Well, that's, that sounds lovely, but is that what God's calling you to accomplish in 2022? And I want you to pray about this. I want you to pray over this and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do for you as it relates to ministry in 2022? And seek his will for your life for your ministry, specifically, individually, purposefully. What does he want you to do? And I can assure you this. It is not to continue to just wander about from this church to that church to this small group to that small group, just being a participant. No. He wants you to be involved, actively involved in prayer, in study. And, and, and I'll tell you this, my grandmother, uh, Esther, passed away uh, 18 months ago. She was 99. And she didn't go, she didn't have a college degree. I don't know that she ever had, I, I remember her talking about her first and only job, non-farm job. She worked at a, a soda fountain, a uh, ice creamery. Uh, but then she got married young. I think she was 18 or 19 when she married my grandfather. And then she spent the rest of her life farming. And you would say, well, what did, well, what did God use her for? Well, God used her for two things. He used her, number one, for hospitality. She was the most hospitable woman you've ever met. And I remember at her funeral, there were two or 300 people there. And the question was asked, how many of you enjoyed a meal at Esther's home? And like every hand went up. Can you imagine 
300 people over the course of your life being invited to your home for a meal where you have to buy the food, think through it, prepare it, set the table, serve it, invest the time to be with people. It's time consuming. Just to have somebody over for dinner is very time consuming. But how often do we do it? So number one was hospitality. Number two, she was the greatest prayer warrior that you've ever met. And I would attribute the fact that I'm still alive on planet Earth to my grandmother's prayers because she prayed constantly. She had a book. She would just pray. So again, as we look at God's calling on our own lives, it doesn't have to be what the world would look at as being significant. Because what we might think is insignificant to God, to God is extremely significant. So don't discount what God has you doing. Don't be looking across somebody else's ministry or what God is using somebody else to do and think, well, how come God's not using me to do that? Well, that's not your calling. Well, what is my calling? That's what you need to be in prayer about. But God is upset that he has created all of these people and they just don't seem to want to follow him. They don't want to do what he's asked them to do. Verse three, the ox knows his master. The donkey knows his owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. H.J. Uh, Ironside, uh, in his commentary, he shared a story years and years ago. Uh, this was before cars and automobiles, so this story goes way back to the 1800s, where somebody robs a bank, but they, for whatever reason, took off and they didn't take their donkey with them. Well, the interesting about, thing about donkeys is, donkeys are known as being very stubborn animals. You don't have to research donkeys. To, stubborn is like their core thing. But what's interesting about donkeys is they know who their master is and they know where they go to get fed. So all you need to do with a donkey is just let him get hungry and then just release him and the donkey will go right back to his owner. Just instinctively will go right back to where he's fed. So the guys robbed this bank. They leave the donkey behind. The bank owner, whoever it was, clearly knew his Bible and said, you know what? Don't even spend any time looking for these robbers. Just untie the donkey and follow the donkey. And the donkey led him right to the robber's house. So the point that Isaiah is making here is that even donkeys know instinctively where they need to go to get fed. But God is saying, my people are dumber than an ox. You've heard that. That guy is dumb as an ox because ox are not known to be smart animals. So God is saying his people are dumb as an ox and as stubborn as a donkey. And even these animals get it. They understand who their maker is, and they acknowledge and give him credit. God says that they are smarter and wiser than his people, for at least they know their master. My people don't consider me at all, is what God is saying. Here, I have blessed them but they have forgotten me, he says. Now understand that at this point in history, Israel is experiencing unparalleled prosperity. So the time of this writing, Israel is out of control. Their economy is booming and everybody is getting rich from the Assyrians and the wars and the pillaging and the profiteering. Israel is experiencing abundance like crazy. And yet, apathy creeps in, as it usually does. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, 
God warned us of this, and he was warning the children of Israel as they were coming out of captivity and going into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. He said, I will bless you, and I will bring you into a land of promise where you will dwell in houses you didn't build, drink from pools you didn't dig, eat from vineyards that you didn't plant. But when you come into the land, beware, lest you become full and forget the Lord your God. What an important word for us this is. Beware when things go well, because the tendency can be to become as dumb as an ox or as stubborn as a mule and forget the blessings of God. Is this perhaps one of the issues we've had here in America? Great abundance for so long. I remember September 11, 2001, and for whatever reason, the song, Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning? You guys remember that song from Alan Jackson? That song came to mind as I was thinking about abundance in America. September 11, 2001, it was a Tuesday. I was living in Salt Lake City. Jacqueline and I had been dating for about 14 months, and we had started attending Calvary Chapel in Salt Lake City. And the attacks happened that morning on that Tuesday. And that night at church, there was a special prayer meeting. Now, you guys go back to wherever you were on that Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001. You know, and then what happened the days and the weeks after this? But our church at that time had this special prayer meeting. And I have never in my life seen that many people at church. It was literally, you, there was nowhere to sit. A huge auditorium sat a thousand people, people standing all around the perimeter, people in the breakout rooms, people everywhere. Many of them, people I had never even met. I've never seen them. they never seen them at church before. They were there because God uses calamity to remind us of his sovereignty. Now, shortly after these attacks, if you guys remember, interest rates were lowered and the government started handing out money to people. You guys remember this, 2002, 2003? Uh, the economy was tanking, and so in an effort to spur the economy, they were giving out loans and grants and reducing interest rates, and people went crazy. And the market went on a holy terror. Church attendance began to wane as people were getting richer and richer from the equity in their primary residence. Now, for those of you that were around <laughs> from 2001 to 2008, this was a seven-year period of some of the most rapid expansion we've seen in the housing sectors and stock market. Uh, people who couldn't afford to buy homes were buying homes, two and three and four homes on these stated loan programs. You guys remember the, the stated loan, no interest loan, uh, no credit check loans. I mean, it was crazy the types of loans that people were getting. And it was just driving the market out of control. And these overpriced and over leveraged residences begin to go into foreclosure. So America is on this unprecedented just climb and there's this euphoric high and all of those people who were at church on September 11, 2001, by September 11, 2007, not even half of them were even still in church. Why? They were all getting rich. Life is grand. Everything's going fantastic. I don't need God right now. Everything's great. I've got great health. I'm making lots of money. I don't need God. <laughs> and then God said, really? You don't need me? And the market tanked. You guys remember, I, I, I still remember this. Foreclosures increased from 2007 to 2009 by over 
and over 8 million people lost their job and became unemployed. And do you know what happened to church attendance in 2008 and 2009 and 2010? Church attendance goes through the roof again. Why? Because now suddenly things aren't going so well. I'm not doing as nearly as well as I was financially. And uh oh, I better get back to church because my life's spiraling out of control and, and I need help. Now we can go back through the annals of history and we can see the same thing played out over and over and over again. Now you've all heard the statement, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat history. Well, guess what? They are eliminating history in our country. They are tearing down statues because they represent a time in our history where people don't like what was going on back then. Well, that happened 200 years ago. And that's part of the history. And if we don't understand it, we are doomed to repeat it. And here we are trying to remove it, the cancel culture. Oh, I don't want to be reminded of that. I don't want to be reminded that, you know, 200 years ago, we had slaves, we had slavery and terrible things happened to people. Well, guess what, you guys, it's 2022. We still have slavery. Did you know that? Every one of you who has a job, you are slave to employer. And you have to get up every morning and you got to get dressed and you got to go to the office and you got to do what they say when they say it so that you can get enough money to pay your mortgage and to buy groceries. And at the end of that two week period of time, you barely have enough money left to do much with. Still slavery. You're still working for somebody else to do their bidding so that you can afford to survive. Well, 200 years ago, we had slaves. They didn't get paid, but they got room and board. They didn't have mortgages, but they got they, they were living to work. Now, I'm not advocating this. But what I am suggesting is this whole idea of cancel culture is a bad idea. Because if we don't know history, we're doomed to repeat history. And we can go back over this again and again and again. And here in Isaiah, written between 701 BC and 681 BC, again, 2,700 years ago, the exact same thing that was happening then is happening right now. When will we learn? May this study be a lesson for all of us here that prosperity is not a reason to depart from God. Prosperity is a wake-up call to draw closer to him. If you've been experiencing unprecedented growth and success and financial gain and prosperity, praise the Lord. But boy, if there was ever a time that you are at risk of being attacked by all of these outside influences trying to get your attention and to get your focus off of God's things, you're headed for fall. Prosperity is not a reason to depart from God, but typically that's what prosperity does. Suddenly we have more money, we have more means to travel and to go do things, and now we can afford more toys and we've got to use them. So church attendance now suddenly isn't a priority because I just bought this new side-by-side -side and I need to go out in the mountains and use it and I'll go to church next Sunday and I'll talk to God next week. Please don't wait for calamity in your own life to finally give God the praise and the honor and the respect that he so justly deserves. Verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you. Laid waste is when overthrown by strangers. 
The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had some, some left, had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom and would have been like Gomorrah. Verse 10, hear the words of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Here, God is indicting his people for being like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we think that Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, when we read that story, it's always believed that Sodom and Gomorrah were judged for homosexuality. And it is often used as a passage specifically to attack that particular sin. But that is not the main reason that Sodom and Gomorrah were judged. It was not the root of the problem. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 40, we read that Sodom and Gomorrah were judged because they heaped luxury upon themselves while lacking compassion for the poor. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the most immoral city on planet Earth. And to this day, it is still used as, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Las Vegas is like Sodom and Gomorrah. Anywhere there's sin taking place, there's Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that's not why Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. They were judged because they were living in such excessive luxury that they stopped caring about anything and anyone but themselves. Verse 11, the multitude of your sacrifices what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings. I have more than enough of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Now, here, God is indicting his people for their religiosity. I've had enough of your meetings, God says. I've had enough of your sacrifices. I've had enough of your empty religious practices. You see, God is not interested in our religion. He is only interested in our relationship with him. Now, I want this to be clear. Not just our relationship, but our personal relationship. Now, this is the relationship that we, each of us individually, make our personal priority. Is our time with the Lord something that we set aside because we desire it and we understand its importance? Or is it something that must be provided for us? Like, what time does church start? Or what time is the Bible study? Or what time do we need to be there? Are we playing offense in our relationship with the Lord? Meaning we're running to him, drawing closer to him, intentionally seeking out and carving out and, and scheduling time specifically for us to be in the Lord's presence alone. Or are we playing defense? And only getting involved when we need something, or we need to save face, or we need to make an appearance, or suddenly life's not going so great, so I need to get back to church. You know, my life is spinning out of control. I need to get back to God. God desires personal intimacy with each and every one of us. He wants our heart. And while there's certainly a time and a place for what I call corporate worship, that is attending a church, it should not be a replacement or the thing that we use to check the box as it relates to spending time 
with the Lord. Now, if you've not yet made your personal daily devotions with the Lord a 2022 commitment, and I want to be clear, this is not a goal, okay? We all set goals, and half the time we don't even think about them three months after we set them. Have you set and established a commitment for personal devotional time with the Lord, just you and him, in 2022? Because it really is the most important part of your day. Now, it doesn't have to be long, okay? So I want to be clear here, because I always hear this, well, yeah, I don't have time for that. It doesn't have to be long, right? It can simply be a reading of a devotion in the morning. You guys can just read uh, a daily dose of boldness. You get that email from our office, from He's the Solution Ministries, every morning. Read it. And then spend a few minutes in personal, quiet prayer time. Just you and him. Now, for me, I like to do this while I'm driving to the office each morning. Now, here's, here's, here's the key to this. You cannot make it such a long thing that it becomes a daunting thing. You simply need to make it long enough to matter, but short enough to make consistency possible. Okay? So as we make this 2022 commitment that every morning we're going to spend some time individually, privately, personally, just, just us and the Lord and husbands and wives. This does not mean the two of you together. No. Husband, you and the Lord together. Wives, you and the Lord together. If you're not married, you and the Lord together. Okay? Just you and him. But here's the reason most goals fail. We create these unrealistic boundaries or, or set of rules, right? I'm going to spend an hour every morning with the Lord. You can't do that consistently, but you can do 10 minutes consistently. So start small. And commit to something that you know you can do every single day. Because the length of time is not what's important. Doing it consistently is what is the most important. And this is the time where you're going to open up your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, this is really on my heart this morning. I'm struggling with this, Lord. I'm discouraged about this. I'm worried about that, Lord. I'm excited for this thing. I'm looking for direction here, Lord. What is it you would have me to do? What is your will? Just you and him. Now, this is really important as we go into verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen because your hands are full of blood. Huh. Okay, so Lee, on the one hand, I'm supposed to set time alone, which is me and the Lord, to pray. But then you're telling me he may not be hearing my prayers. Well, why wouldn't? God hear the prayers of his people because their hands were full of blood. Now, not literally, but figuratively, because sometimes we wonder why our prayers aren't answered. We go to church regularly. We lift our hands in praise. We tithe. But God says that all of those actions are irrelevant if we're harboring sin in our own life, if we are compromising, if we're trying to be righteous through our own efforts or energy, if we're failing to realize our need to come before God in, broken, in brokenness, God won't answer our prayers. Not because he's mad at us or because he doesn't like us anymore, but because he's saying, hey, there's something wrong in your relationship with me. And if I continue to answer your prayers, you will persist in doing those things. And those things are what will destroy you. So you're not going to sense my presence. You're not going to have answers to your prayers in order that you might seek me. 
Now, take a, take a note right out of David in the Psalms. Begin your devotional time and your prayer time with the Lord simply by saying, Lord, search my heart. Lord, is there anything in my life that is hindering my worship and my prayer with you? Lord, am I, am I, is there something I'm doing? Am I harboring sin, Lord? Is there something that I've been thinking about or pondering that is against or opposed to what you would have me to do? You know, business owners, this is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> it's a new year, right? April 15th, U.S. citizens is coming. Tax time. Are we being honorable in our taxes? Are we paying what we need to be paying? Or are we skimming? Are we fibbing? Are we taking deductions and write-offs that didn't actually happen? But our accountant said it was okay, so we do it. Okay, it's, and you think, well, Lee, that's so minor. It's, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks. Right, it is. So just pay it. You will get nowhere cheating other people in anything, business, life, marriage. If you're cheating people, if you're treating people poorly, if you're not being honorable in your dealings, if you're not being honorable in your marriage, if you are you know, spending time looking at pornography instead of looking at your wife or your husband, if you are dating the wrong person simply because you're so tired of being alone, you'd rather be with somebody who doesn't really know or walk with the Lord, but I'm praying for him, so hopefully he'll come around. No, it's not how it works. We have to be broken when we come to the Lord, and we need to ask him to search us out and say, Lord, is there any evil, wicked way or thought in me? If there is, Lord, reveal it to me so I can purge of it. I can, I can confess of that sin. I can be done with it. Because the most important thing for me, Lord, is to have sweet fellowship with you. That's my priority. Verse 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they'll be like wool. The people were full of blood and sin, apathy and iniquity. And yet God says, my blood will wash you clean if you'll just come before me and admit your need of my work and mercy in your life. And that's what we are to do, you guys. If we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John chapter 1, verse 9. All he asks from you and me is to be honest before him and say, Lord, I know this isn't right. I need your mercy. I need you to deal with me. Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to change me. What a glorious invitation. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Now, if you do not have this verse underlined in your Bible, I want you to underline this verse right now in your Bible. It's okay to write in your Bible. <laughs> underline Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 come now and let us reason together saith the Lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool no matter how glaring and bright your sin might be I can make it white as snow that's what the father says in London many years ago, a minister and his young son were standing in their window, looking down at the street as a parade was passing by. 
In the parade, along with the clowns and the marching bands, British soldiers marched in their red coats. Look at those soldiers, Daddy, the little boy said. Look how white their coats are. The minister looked at his son. He said, son, their coats are red. And the little boy said, no, Dad, they're white. And the minister stooped down to his son's vantage point, and he saw that his son was looking through a pane of stained glass that bordered the window. And seen through the red glass, the red coats appeared to be white. And suddenly a light went on in the minister's head. He said, that's it. Though my sins are as scarlet, the father looks at them through the filter of the blood of his son, and he sees me white and pure and clean. Verse 19, so if you are willing and obedient, you will eat from the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. If Israel had merely accepted the invitation of the Lord to reason together with him, they would eat instead of being eaten, and they would experience peace rather than than persecution. Verse 21, see how faithful the city has become a harlot. She once was full of justice, righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Although Judah still had the appearance of righteousness and integrity, one needn't have looked very far to see what was compromised as unrefined silver and diluted wine. They were cheats. They had dishonest scales. They were not honoring the Lord in their business and the way they conducted business. Therefore, verse 24, the Lord, the Almighty, the one of Israel declares, Ah, I will get relief from my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. And I will turn my hand against you and I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your judges in, as in days of old, your counselors as at the beginning. And afterward, you will be called the righteous, the faithful city. Zion will be the redeemed with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. Here is hope that if the people of Judah would come and reason with the Lord, if they would be willing and obedient to follow his command, he would restore and renew their land. Verse 28. <clears throat> But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. The oaks and the gardens spoken of here were elements in the practice of idolatry. They idolize the strength of the oak. He goes on to say, verse 30. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become under, will become tender, and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. The man who delights in the law of the Lord <clears throat> shall be like a tree whose leaf doesn't wither, is what we read in Psalms chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. The man who believes on the Lord shall be full of living water. John chapter 7, verse 38. Here, however, Judah would be like a dying tree in a dry garden because she forsook the Lord. <clears throat> so in closing, 
I know we went very long this morning. I apologize. We had a lot of introductory things to take care of as we get into this chapter. But in closing, it says, though my sins are scarlet, glaring and ugly, I choose to heed the invitation of my father who says, come, let us reason together. Stay away from sin in the future and confess the sin of your past and realize it can be white as snow because of the blood of my son. How I encourage you to take the Lord up on his invitation to come to him, to reason with him and repent of any sin the Holy Ghost is bringing to your mind right now. Now, it might be something obvious or something subtle, but you know it's a cord that is beginning to wrap itself tightly around you, a worm eating away inside of your gut, a detective beginning to follow you, a cloud obscuring God's glory from you, a thief robbing the harvest from you. And if I can be so bold, <clears throat> I believe that some of you right now, the thing that is keeping you from the Lord is worry. You are worried constantly. You're worried about COVID. You're worried about death. You're worried about finances. You're worried about government. You're worried about elections. You're worried about your business. You just live in this constant state of worry, and it is stealing your joy. And you wonder why your prayers or you feel like your prayers aren't being answered by God. It's because worry is sin. It is keeping you from being aligned in total commitment with the Lord. You are worried and you need to stop worrying and start trusting. And if worry is the sin that has been keeping you from a right relationship with the Lord this morning, you need to confess to that and say, Lord, I am a perpetual worry wart. And Lord, I know that that's a sin because I don't need to worry. You say in your Bible not to worry about tomorrow for today has enough worries of its own. You also say that, well, I, I will only give you as much as you can bear. I won't give you more than that. I was hearing a lot of worry this morning in our prayers and our prayer requests. And guys, we need not to worry. We need to trust and we need to have faith. And when you feel lonely and separated from God, remember that God does not abandon you. However, our sins do cut us off from him. And the only sure cure for this kind of loneliness is to restore a meaningful relationship with God by confessing your sin, obeying his instructions, and communicating with him regularly. Come, the Lord says, come now. Let's pray. Lord, I, uh, I thank you, Lord, for this passage. I thank you for bringing these things to our attention. And Lord, I, I just want to lift up each and every one of us this morning, because Lord, we would not be being honest with you or ourselves if we didn't confess that we worry. We worry too much and we worry about all of these things and we worry about things that aren't even going to happen. And Lord, we worry instead of trust and we fret and we, we plot and we plan instead of just pray and trust. So, Lord, help us to understand that you have a plan and a purpose and a will, and you are working out all things together for your good and for your glory through us, through our lives, through the individual ministries that you've given to each one of us. But, Lord, Satan is attacking us from all sides as we worry. Lord, help us to not worry about getting COVID. If we get COVID, it's in your plan. It's your will. 
Lord, help us to see that opportunity for what it is, time to spend with you. And Lord, I know that there are people that have ill health and we've all lost friends and family and loved ones to this disease, Lord. And it's, it's scary. But Lord, this worry is stealing our joy. This worry is keeping us from you. This worry is keeping us from fellowship from other people. So Lord, help us to be responsible. Help us to take the necessary precautions, if that's social distancing and masking. And Lord, for those that feel called to do so, becoming vaccinated. Lord, whatever it whatever it means. But Lord, help us to stop worrying and to start trusting. Lord, restore our relationship with you so that we can be on fire for you, Lord, so that we can begin to be bold for you again. Restore us back to that place, Lord, where we were on fire for you. That is our prayer this morning. So, Lord, we thank you for this study. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for all that you're doing. We trust you, we love you, and we surrender to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need prayer, guys, if you are worrying and you know this and you would like to pray with somebody, we would love to pray with you. Call our prayer hotline, 800-461-0216. If you feel like you are just disconnected from the Lord and you just want to chat, you want to pray, let's do that. Call us, 800-461-0216. Okay? Well, God bless you guys. I pray that you have a fantastic week. Remember... Why worry when you can pray? Uh, and let's get back to that place of boldness. Be looking for that email from Donna and that post on your 2022 ministry goals. And uh, I'll look forward to being here with you next Sunday, Lord willing, uh, if we're still here. And we'll pick it up in Isaiah chapter 2. So until next time, God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye, everybody.